So, welcome everybody. I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Club. I'm really happy to welcome you here. Uh, you are incredibly punctual today, <laughs> and I'm really surprised about that because uh, usually we have to wait for a long crowd. Instead, you have been really surprising us. And um, um, I want, uh, first of all, uh, to thank our collaborators that have been uh, working hard to make this event uh, happen. Uh, Kim Foss, Nada Baker, Rael Ferrer, and also Jonas Franchi. And uh, I also want to ask you to do a small applause to them, because otherwise, when we start, everybody will forget uh, who work on this, and they deserve this. Then uh, I want to start introducing a bit this event and saying that this is our 14th event. So we have been working since 2015. This is our fourth year. And uh, I want uh, to thank, of course, our funders that allowed us uh, to be here today. Uh, so first of all, the Senat Verwaltung für Kultur und Europa, the Senat Department for Culture and Europe in Berlin, the Riva and David Logan Foundation, the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation, and the, also the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Then I want to thank our cooperation partners, the Kunst and Kreuzberg Bethanien and also Spectrum, that have been collaborating with us since the beginning. And for this specific event, I want to deeply thank also the mobile counseling team against right-wing extremism, that is called MBR, uh, and the Alexander from Humboldt Institute for Internet Society and the host writer and our media partners Taz, Ex Berliner and Furterfield. Then there is always the turning of the page. <laughs> and uh, I want uh, to introduce a bit why we are being here today and of course our speakers will lately go on with this discussion, so I don't want to be the only one defining what is going to happen today and tomorrow, but at least I want to give a bit uh, our perspective. Um, we decided to call this uh, conference uh, Infiltration Challenging Supremacism, and uh, sadly, uh, everybody knows uh, that uh, lately, also especially in Germany, there have been a lot of debate uh, uh, related to right-wing extremism, for example, if we speak about uh, uh, the facts of Chemnitz. But we also want to say that this uh, is unfortunately not uh, something that is only happening in these days, uh, but so we are witnessing uh, increasement of hate uh, and also supremacism since many years now. And, uh, has been since really long time also the uh, perspective of the Disruption Network Club to try to investigate systems from within. So not just uh, trying to be outside the systems, but also trying to uh, understand how these systems work and trying to uh, invite people that are also doing this kind of research. And uh, I also think that uh, especially today, it's important to move away from a rhetoric of uh, hate and frontal opposition because we also know that this kind of rhetoric is exactly uh, what our opponent wants and also something that is often becoming a playground for uh, media that are not uh, often reporting, uh, I mean, media that in a sense wants to report the opposition but don't want to report uh, uh, what are instead uh, the critical reasons of our discussion. So I think that it's really important to try to always understand that even if, of course, we have to oppose a certain way of thinking, so the challenging the supremacism, we have also to try to study and being literal in, that, in what this means and trying to understand uh, how we can uh, create uh, uh, results that are also long-term lasting. And uh, in this perspective that I want to uh, propose with this event, we're also trying to invite people uh, that are producing infiltration, uh, so they have been inside the right-wing extremism to understand what these people are actually doing and understanding the aims. Or we have been inviting people that have been befriending white supremacists uh, 
to really try to investigate this culture from within. Another that as researchers have been um, applying the discourse of participatory observation. And uh, in, in a sense, we will also see in these days that uh, these kind of methods are not always uh, uh, the faster one, and uh, they take time. Uh, most of the time, they're also really frustrating because we are speaking about uh, a change of culture. And the perspective that I'm also trying to bring here is that perhaps uh, is because we are witnessing a certain culture war, then it's really on the realm of culture that we have to uh, be active and trying to make a change. Uh, so. With this event, we really want to encourage uh, a reflection that is based on long-term strategies and also different way of political conflict. And uh, you will see that all the people that we have been invited are applying this kind of concept in very different ways. So I want to start uh, with uh, introducing our wonderful keynote, Daryl Davis, that I'm really happy to have uh, with us, because I think also his experience uh, is something completely unique. I'm not going to go too much into that, because we have our moderator that will speak uh, mostly about this, but I really feel that I want to deeply thank Daryl for being here and also telling us a story that started since the 80s. So when I'm speaking about the fact that certain experiences take time, I think he is really a wonderful example and also experience that can bring hope, not hate, and often also great results. Um, we have as moderator uh, for the keynote that is entitled Clandestine Relationship, How and Why a Black Man Befriended White Supremacist, um, uh, Anna Muller from MBR, so I want to introduce uh, Anna. Um, she is uh, born in 1988 and uh, she is coming from Berlin. Uh, she studied law at the European University Viadrina in Frankfurt Oder, and uh, she, she has been always studying and working with the discourse of racism, racism right-wing uh, populism, and also right-wing extremism. And she is working at the mobile counseling team against right-wing extremism in Berlin that started in 2001 and has been offering counseling and support uh, for anyone that in Berlin is willing or needing to become active against right-wing extremism, racism, and anti-Semitism. So I also want to thank uh, MBR because they have been supporting our conference as well with uh, their uh, collaboration. So I just leave the stage uh, to Anna that will introduce Daryl and then Daryl will uh, speak for around 40 minutes and uh, then we will have a question answer with Anna Muller, Daryl Davis and the public. Thank you. Thank you, Tatjana, for introduci introducing me um, and also a warm welcome from me and from well, the mobile counseling team against right-wing extremism. Um, I'm really looking forward to hear um, Daryl's keynote today as I've been reading up a bit on him uh, and I had the luck to already watch the movie that will be shown at the weekend as well, as far as I know. For Daryl, you can say that two things mainly influenced his life. First of all, it was growing up as the son of a foreign officer, as an officer for the Department of State Foreign Service. So he grew up all around the world in different countries, different cultures, met people of different religion. And the second thing is, of course, his music. He is um, a blues and R&B musician. Very nice music. It was very nice to listen to it while preparing for the conference. Um, these were the key factors that influenced his life. And I think there's also the key factors that led to him befriending members of the Ku Klux Klan, or more correct, former members of the Ku Klux Klan. As I said, Daryl grew up um, amongst children from other diplomats, different countries, different religions, so he was a bit oblivious of racist beliefs and of, as well of the racism in America up until the age of 10, when he had moved back to the US, to Belmont in Massachusetts, and he made his first cruel experience with racism. 
He was participating with his club scout troop in a local parade and people began to throw rocks and bottles at him. And he was really confused. He didn't know what was going on at this time. And he didn't realize that they were only aiming at him because he was the only black boy in the parade at this time. When the first shock and the confusion had passed a bit, a question started to form in Daryl's head. And one of this was, why do you hate me when you know nothing about me? And this is a question that occupied him for, for many years, even when he was studying music um, at the Howard University, where he graduated in 1980 with a Bachelor of Music and a keyboardist extraordinaire. And the music was then the step that led to meeting or getting to know a member of the Ku Klux Klan. In 1983, he was playing country western music in a so-called or mainly white bar in Frederick, Maryland, when a guy came up to him and said it was the first time he had heard a black man play as well as Jerry Lee Lewis. Davis said, oh, Jerry Lee learned to play from a black blues and boogie-woogie piano players. And by the way, he's a friend of mine. So this was the start of a conversation. This was an opportunity Daryl found there talking to a man who, in this conversation, said to him, I've actually never spoken to a black guy in my life because I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Daryl saw a chance here. He took up the opportunity, started talking to this person, and later to other members of the Ku Klux Klan. Some of them have left the Ku Klux Klan, some not, but he's still in a dialogue with them, and I think... This is his story to tell now, how he met the members of the Ku Klux Klan and how it happened that they changed their view and what was his role in this changing of opinions. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you, Tatiana, for bringing me here. So as Anna was saying, I was in a bar uh, playing with a country band when a man came up to me and expressed his surprise that a black man could play in the style of Jerry Lee Lewis. And what I explained to him was where Jerry Lee Lewis learned how to play. He learned to, how to play from black blues and boogie-woogie piano players. That's where that style originated. And we listened to the same people. The man did not believe me. Uh, he did not believe that Jerry Lee learned anything from black people. I told the man, hey, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis is a friend of mine. He has told me himself where he's learned how to play. The guy did not believe I knew Jerry Lee, but he was fascinated and wanted to buy me a drink. I don't drink alcohol, but I went to his table and I had a, a cranberry juice. And in the course of the conversation, he said that he had never sat down, had a drink with a black man. And I was naive. I asked him why. And at first he did not answer me, but then it came out that he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And I started laughing at him because I did not believe him. Because I know a lot about the Ku Klux Klan. And they don't just come and embrace a black man and want to hang out and buy them a drink. It doesn't work that way. So I, I thought he was joking with me. And he went inside his pocket, put out his wallet, and hand me his uh, Klan membership card. When I saw this thing, the red circle, the white cross, and red blood drop, I know this is for real. So I stopped laughing, and now I'm questioning myself, why am I at this table with this man? But we talked, and uh, it was a very friendly conversation. He gave me his phone number because he wanted me to call him whenever I was to come back to play with this band in this bar. He wanted to bring his friends, you know, his clan friends, clan, clansmen and clanswomen to see this black man play like Jerry Lee. So I would call him and he would come. But many, you know, t t much time had passed and it occurred to me, because as, as uh, Anna was saying, when I was a kid and people, you know, I was age 10, when people threw rocks and bottles at me for being black. And I had, I did not understand, I had no idea why they were doing this. And my parents explained to me what racism was. So I had formed that question in my mind. How can you hate me when you don't even know me? And I, I have a vast library of books on white supremacy, black supremacy, the Ku Klux Klan, the Nazis, the neo-Nazis, everything. I've read all this stuff. None of these books 
answered my question. And so much time had passed since I met that Klansman, and it occurred to me, you know what? That is my opportunity to find the answer. How can you hate me when you don't even know me? Because my books could not answer the question. So who better to ask that question than to ask somebody who would join an organization, an organization that has about 150 years of history of hating people because of what they look like or what they believe. So I decided, you know what? I'm gonna contact that guy and ask him to connect me with the leader of the Ku Klux Klan for the state in which I live. Currently, I live in the state of Maryland, right outside of Washington, D.C. I'm from Chicago originally. And the state leader is what's called a Grand Dragon. A national leader is called an Imperial Wizard. So I contacted this guy. He did not want to connect me with the, with the uh, Klan leader. I persuaded him to do it. I was there meeting with him in person. He, he made me promise him that I would not tell this Klan leader, his name was Roger Kelly, the Klan leader, where I got his information if this man gave it to me. I said, okay. So he gave me Mr. Kelly's phone number, gave me his address. I had my secretary contact Mr. Kelly and tell him that she's working for a man who is writing a book on the Ku Klux Klan. Would he consider sitting down and giving her boss an interview. I told my secretary, do not tell Mr. Kelly that I'm black, unless he asks. I, you know, I want him to find out when he meets me. She said, okay. So he did not ask what color I was. We arranged to meet in a motel in Frederick. Mary, my secretary, she and I got there early, several hours early. The way the room is situated, if you people are in the hallway of the motel, and the door is here. You must walk in the room, turn to your right, and the room is back here. You cannot see who's in the room if you're standing in the hallway until you come in and turn the corner. I took the lamp table, I put it over here in the corner of the room, took the lamp off, I put a chair on one side for me, a chair on the other side for Mr. Kelly. I gave my secretary some money, I sent her down the hall to get some, some sodas, Coca-Cola, whatever else, put it inside the ice bucket, get it cold, because I want to be hospitable when, when Mr. Kelly arrived. I want to be say, hey, you know, would you like a cold drink? Now, I was told by this other Klansman, Daryl, do not fool with Roger Kelly. Roger Kelly will kill you. But I was determined I want to sit this man down and ask him, how can you sit there and look at me? You don't even know me. All you see is this. How can you hate me when you don't know me? So I had to talk to him. I said, I'll be careful. I promised him. I said, OK. So everything was ready. Well, right on time at 5.15, I'm back here where you can't see me. Mary gets up, goes around, opens the door. In walks the bodyguard for the Klan leader. He's wearing military camouflage. The Ku Klux Klan insignia right here, the red circle of white cross blood drop. Over here are the letters KKK. On his beret, on his cap, on his head, it was embroidered Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Right here he had a gun. He comes in, Mr. Kelly is in a dark blue suit and tie walking directly behind him. When the bodyguard turned the corner and saw me, he froze. Well, Mr. Kelly did not realize that his bodyguard stopped. and He walked into his back and knocked him forward. So they're tripping around and they're like looking all over the room like, uh-uh. Well, I knew what was wrong. They're looking for a white guy, and they got me. So they're thinking the receptionist gave them the wrong room number, or this is an ambush. So I stood up. I went like this to show I had nothing in my hands. And I walked forward. I said, hi, Mr. Kelly. I'm Daryl Davis. He shook my hand. So far, so good. The bodyguard shook my hand. I said, come on, come on in. Have a seat. Mr. Kelly sat down. And I, I was getting ready to sit down opposite. The bodyguard stood at attention on his right side. And before I could sit down, Mr. Kelly says, Mr. Davis, do you have any form of, of identification? I said, sure. I gave him my driver's license. And he says, oh, you live on Flat Street in Silver Spring. Now I'm thinking, why is he looking at my address? Is he going to come to my house and burn a cross? All he has to do is look at my name, look at my picture, look at me, and then give me back my license. And here he is reading my address. 
So he made me a little unsettled, but I did not want to let him know that he had unedged me. So, but I want to let him know, do not come to my house uninvited and do anything stupid. So I said to him, I said, yes, Mr. Kelly, that is where I live, and you live at, and I said his house number and his street. That way I was making the playground level, right? If you come visit me, I'm gonna come visit you. So we're gonna confine all our visiting to this motel room. So he smiled, he nodded, he understood. I did not find out that day, it was many months later, that I had no reason to fear Mr. Kelly. The reason he mentioned my street was because one of his members lived down the road from me. And Mr. Kelly had to, had to travel on my street to go to his clan member's house. I had no idea. It was pure coincidence. So anyway, we got on with this interview. I had a bag similar to that one there beside my, my chair. And I had blank cassettes for my cassette player so I could record the interview. I had a copy of the Bible because the Ku Klux Klan claims to be a Christian organization and they say the Bible preaches racial separation. I've read the Bible. I never saw that. I want to be able to say, hey, here, Mr. Kelly, here's my Bible. Show me the chapter and the verse where it says blacks and whites must be separate. So I'm all prepared. Every time Mr. Kelly said, Mr. Davis, the Bible says, I'd reach down, pull up my Bible. Show me, Mr. Kelly. Or if my cassette ran out of tape, I'd reach down, get a new cassette, put it in there. Every time I reached like this, the bodyguard reached like this. And after a while, he realized, you know, I understood because he did not know what's in the bag. He's doing his job, which is to protect his boss. So after a while, he relaxed. He realized there was no threat in the bag. I went in and out of the bag. He did not move. He was okay. A little bit over one hour into this interview, we were talking and suddenly there was a strange noise. It's very short, very quick. And we all jumped. I knew, I knew that Mr. Kelly had made this noise. I didn't know what it was. I had never heard a noise like that. I couldn't figure it out. But I knew that he made it. How did I know that? Because I didn't make it. So if I didn't make it, he must have made it, right? Process of elimination. And so I jumped up out of my chair because I could not figure out what the noise was. I perceived it to be a threatening noise, an evil noise, and I felt my life was in danger. And I could hear the other Klansman's voice saying to me, Daryl, do not fool with Roger Kelly. Roger Kelly will kill you. So my mind is racing, what did I do? What did I say to make Mr. Kelly make some strange noise? And when you fear for your life, you will go into what is called survival mode, where you want to protect yourself. When you go into survival mode, you will do one of four things. Some people, the fear is so great, they faint, they pass out, they cannot handle it. I don't pass out, I don't faint. Another thing people will do, their muscles will tighten and they start shaking like this. You can be taking a stick or a baseball bat and hitting them on the head. They will not be like this. They will, it's, it's called paralysis by fear. They become so frightened, their muscles become paralyzed. They cannot move. I don't do that either. The third thing people will do is to run away. That is the best option to put, seriously, to put as much distance between yourself and the source of fear as quickly as possible. Separate yourself. Go in the other direction. That would, would be what I would have done if I had the opportunity. However, you cannot outrun a bullet in a motel room. If somebody's going to shoot you in a motel room, where are you going to run? Okay, so the fourth option is what we call a preemptive strike. You attack them before they attack you. You put it down quickly. So when I came up out of my chair, I was going to attack Mr. Kelly and the bodyguard. I was going to dive across the table, grab the bodyguard, grab Mr. Kelly, and slam them down to the ground and take away the bodyguard's gun. I am that strong and I am that fast. 
okay? And that's what was in my mind. But when I came up, because I had no gun, my secretary had no gun. The only person that I knew who had a gun was the bodyguard, because you could see it here. I did not know if Mr. Kelly had a gun up under his jacket or not. All I knew was I didn't want to get shot, so I'm going to stop it right now. And when I came up to attack, I'm looking right in his face. He's right here. I'm right here. The table's very small. And I'm looking right in his eyes. I did not say a word, but my eyes were speaking. My eyes were speaking loud and clear. In fact, my eyes were shouting at him. He could hear my eyes. My eyes were saying to him, what did you just do? His eyes were fixated on my eyes. He didn't say a word, but I could read his eyes like telepathy. His eyes were saying to me, what did you just do? And the bodyguard is like this, looking at both of us like, what did either one of you all just do? Well, my secretary, she was up here sitting on top of the dresser. She realized what happened, and she began explaining it. The ice in the ice bucket had melted, and the cans of soda fell down the ice. And then it happened again, and we all began laughing, all of us. We began laughing at how ignorant we all had been. Now, this was a teaching moment. I won't say it was a learning moment, not yet. It was a teaching moment. And the lesson taught is this. All because some foreign, and underline or circle, highlight the word foreign, entity of which we were ignorant, that being the bucket of ice and cans of soda, we were ignorant because we didn't know that it was making noise over there. All because some foreign entity entered into our little comfort zone by the, by way, by via the noise that it made, we became fearful of each other and accusatory of each other. So the lesson taught is this, ignorance breeds fear. We fear those things we do not understand. If you do not keep that fear in check, it will escalate to hatred. We hate those things that we fear because they frighten us. If you do not keep that hatred in check, it will escalate to destruction. We want to destroy those things that we hate. Why? Because they frighten us. But guess what? They may have been harmless, and we were just ignorant. So we saw the whole chain, the whole cycle, almost go to completion. Completion would have been destruction had the bodyguard shot somebody, namely me or my secretary, or had I jumped across the table and hurt one of them. So it stopped short of the last component. However, the whole world, everywhere, even here in Berlin, you saw the news, two hours from my house last year, August 11 and 12, 2017, in Charlottesville, Virginia, there was a lot of ignorance, a lot of fear, a lot of hatred. And that combination completed the cycle of destruction when a white supremacist got inside his car and tried to run down as many protesters as he could. He injured 20 people. He ended up killing one, murdering one girl, Heather Heyer, with his car. Ignorance breeds fear, fear breeds hatred, hatred breeds destruction. We saw the cycle completed in Charlottesville. So anyway, Mr. Kelly and I continued our talking. The bodyguard was cool, he didn't move. It kept making the noise. At the end, I thanked Mr. Kelly. I shook his hand, I said, thank you for your time. I appreciate that. So he gave me his clan card and he said, keep in touch. I'm thinking, what? You know, I did not come here to make friends with the clan. I came here to find out how can you hate me when you don't know me? I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. I said, well, thank you, Mr. Kelly. I have some other clan people I need to interview up north, down south, Midwest, West Coast, et cetera. Uh, I will give you a call when the book is ready for publication. He said, thank you, good luck, and he and the uh, bodyguard left. On my way home, I said to Mary, she's over here in my passenger seat, I'm driving. I said, you know, I, I like Roger Kelly. Her head almost hit the ceiling of my car. She said, what? How can you like him? He hates you. I said, yes, I know. I said, 
I don't like what he stands for, but I like him as a person. We have more in common than we do in contrast. Most of what we have in contrast centers around how we each feel about race. He feels his race is superior to my race. I feel my race is equal to his race. He feels the races must be apart. I feel they can be together. Other than that, we agreed on many things. I said to her, I said, you know what? I will stay in contact with Mr. Kelly. I began calling him and saying, hey man, I'm playing up in your county. Come see me with my band. He would come. He'd bring his, he'd bring his bodyguard, but then they'd get out there and they'd dance to our music. I would invite him down to my house. He would come to my house. He lives an hour and a half from my house. He would come down to my house with his bodyguard. He would sit on the couch. I'd sit across the table in a chair. The bodyguard would sit next to him. Sometimes the bodyguard was bored. He'd take out his gun, he'd twirl it on his finger like this while Mr. Kelly and I are talking. And um, sometimes I would invite over some of my white friends, some of my Jewish friends, some of my other black friends, just to engage with Mr. Kelly so he would have different perspectives other than just mine. I didn't want him to think, oh, Daryl Davis is an exception. No, I'm not the exception. Maybe he is the exception for believing all this nonsense. So we would we'd have these conversations. This one, we would even eat at my dinner table. All right? Now, Mr. Kelly had told me that first day in the motel that I am inferior because I'm black. White people are superior. Black people have smaller brains than white people. Uh, black people are prone to crime. We, we have a criminal mentality. Black people are very lazy. We try to take advantage of the government welfare. Every stereotype you can think of, I heard it. All right? But I know who I am. I know that he, Mr. Kelly cannot define me. If that's his perspective, he wants to believe that, that's fine. But he's believing a lie, because I have never been on welfare. I have never committed any kind of crime. I have more education than him and all his plan put together. So, you know, he's not defining me. I don't know who he's talking about, all right? So I'm not worried about that. And so here he is in my house, in my inferior house, sitting on my inferior sofa, eating my inferior food at my inferior dining room table, all right? But yet we're doing this together. This went on for two years with the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. He never invited me to his house. But then, two years later, he was coming to my house by himself because he trusted me that much, right? Then he got promoted from Grand Dragon state leader to national leader, Imperial Wizard. He began inviting me to his house. I would go to his house, I would see his clan meeting room where he'd have his meetings, I'd take some pictures, take some more notes from my book. Now the whole time I'm interviewing other clan people also. There were plenty of clan people who would talk to me, there were those who would not talk to me, there were those who wanted to fight me, all right? Fortunately, I won, both in the street and in court. But those were few and far between. Most of them were, were cooperative. So I would go to these clan rallies, I would watch them in their robes and hoods, clansmen and clanswomen, they make a big circle around this big um, wooden cross, maybe 20, 30 feet high, two wooden beams that are tied together with rope. And the cross, the cross is wrapped in a burlap material. The burlap has been soaked in what they call clan cologne, which is actually diesel fuel, kerosene. And they put it in the ground, and they all have torches. And they move around in a circle around this cross. And then one of the leaders will say, Klansmen, halt. And they all stop. He'll say, for my God. And they all say, for my God. And they bow. For my race, for my race, for my country, for my country, for my clan, for my clan. White power, white power. I'm standing there, I'm watching all this stuff happen. And then he'll say, Klansmen, approach the cross. They close into the base of the cross with their torches. Klansmen, light the cross. They throw their torches down at the foot and whoosh. This big cross is on fire. And then they give some speeches, and then the rally is over. So I went to, to, a, to a bunch of these, not just with Roger Kelly, but other people as well. CNN, the cable news network, heard about a black musician and a Klan leader. They knew who I was through music. They knew who Mr. Kelly was through the Klan. They thought this would make an interesting story. So they called me and said, hey, you know, can we do a story? I said, sure. 
They said, when's the next time you're going to a Klan rally? I said, I'll call you. Well, I got invited to one by Mr. Kelly. I called CNN. I said, I'm going on Saturday, whatever it was, that date, that summer. I said, okay, are you performing anywhere on Friday night? I said, yes, my band is, is playing wherever. They came to the club, they filmed my band to show what I normally do. And then Saturday morning, CNN came to my house and they followed me two hours up the road to this Klan rally. And they said, do you think Mr. Kelly will even talk to us? I said, I will do better than that. When the rally is over, I will speak with Mr. Kelly and I will get him to come back to my house. And you can interview the Imperial Wizard in the Ku Klux Klan inside a black man's house. They said, oh, okay. So when the rally was over, I spoke with Mr. Kelly. I told him what was up. He said, okay. He drove two hours out of his way to my house. No bodyguard. He sat in my basement and interviewed with CNN. And this clip was shown on CNN and HLN every hour for 24 hours all over the world. I'm gonna show it to you right now, but I want you to pay particular attention to what Mr. Kelly says. He says that even though he and I would do different things together, it did not change his view on the Ku Klux Klan because his views on the Ku Klux Klan had been cemented in his mind for years. And then he goes on to say how he believes in separation of the races because he thinks that is the, in the best interest of all races. But also listen to what he says at the, towards the end of the clip, what he says about respect. That's another teaching moment, something very interesting. And then at the end, the two CNN uh, news desk anchored reporters, they make a comment, which I thought was, uh, was, for, was very interesting. So if we can uh, roll the clip and kill the lights. This is CNN. Welcome to this final hour of CNN Sunday Morning. I'm Bob Kane, and today for Miles O'Brien. Good morning to you all. I'm Joey Chen. Friendship can transcend all kinds of boundaries. Just look at us. And two men in Washington <laughs> area are showing that even an African-American man and a member of the Ku Klux Klan can find common ground. CNN's Carl Rochelle reports. Carol Davis plays a hot piano. It's part of the show, and it makes him stand out. He also stands out here. Davis is one of the few African Americans you will ever find attending a KKK rally. More than attending, he is welcome. I got more respect for that black man than I do you white niggers All out right. there. It's been a tough day for the Klan. Their Maryland rally found many local residents rejecting the message of white separatism. After it's over, Daryl Davis hangs around backstage with his friend, Klan wizard Roger Kelly. Huh? It's not unusual for blacks and whites to be friends, but it is unusual to find a black man and a Klan leader chatting pleasantly over an orange soda after a Klan rally. The relationship started over a book Davis was writing. His secretary set up an interview with Roger Kelly, but didn't tell him Davis was black. They talked and talked some more. Davis learning about the Klan, Kelly learning about Davis. We get to know one another and we do different things, you know, it's. It hasn't changed my views about the Klan, you know, because my views on the Klan has been pretty much cemented in my mind for years. Kelly and his Klan friends go to hear Davis and his band. And Davis goes to their rallies. I sat on, on, on the front row and, uh, and listened to each uh, Klansman speak. Um, some things I agreed with, other things I did not agree with. Davis thinks that his presence promotes badly needed understanding. Hate stems, I believe, from fear, from fear of the unknown. And I think this is all across the board, regardless of whether it's a Klansman or anything else. But he has no illusions about the Klan. If he did, his friend would be quick to disabuse them. And I believe in separation of the races. I believe that's in the best interest of all races. Does he really? Or has friendship transcended the color barrier? Listen to Kelly at a Klan rally. I'm a far out man to hell I'm back, because I believe in what he stands for and he believes in what I stand for. 
A lot of times we don't agree with everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me. And I'll respect him to sit down and listen to him. The strange relationship of a KKK wizard and his black buddy. In Washington, I'm Carl Rochelle, CNN Sunday Morning. Strange. Strange. Good adjective. Certainly strange. that. Certainly that. Okay, that's the clip. Now, as a result of that clip, I got a publishing deal uh, for, my, for the book that I was writing. It came out called Clandestine Relationships. Clandestine spelled with a K, not a C. But, and then later on, a documentary, which I believe is going to be shown here on Sunday at the Spectrum called Accidental Courtesy, where you can see the, the, the film crew following me around for a couple years interviewing Nazis and, and KKK people. But more importantly, you heard Mr. Kelly say that even though he and I would do different things together, it did not change his views on the Klan, because his views on the Klan had been what? Cemented in his mind for many years. And then he goes on to say how he believes in separation of the races, uh, because he thinks that is in the best interest of all races. But towards the end, the imperial wizard, he said something very interesting. He said he respected me. What's that all about? I'm his enemy. I'm a black guy. He's the head of the Klan. He said, we may not agree on everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me, and I respect him to sit down and listen to him. Those are his words. If you don't take anything else home tonight, take that home with you and apply that in your daily activity when you are in conversation with someone with whom you may have a difference of opinion. It does not have to be about race. There are enough topics out here, you know, that you, you, where you're on one side, somebody's on the other. It could be abortion, it could be political, it could be nuclear weapons, the environment, global warming, whatever the hot topic is. You have your opinion, they have theirs. Give your adversary a platform. Allow them to air their views. If you believe them, fine, no problem. If you don't believe them, that's fine too, no problem. You challenge them, but you don't challenge them violently or rudely. You say, look, I need more clarification as to why you think I should believe this way. Give me more explanation. And when you do that, there is an excellent chance that they will reciprocate after they explain their position and ask you what you think. You make sure you have done your homework so you have your facts and you can present your facts on your platform in an intelligent and influential manner. Because at the end of the day, you each must think about what the other person said. And if somebody says something to you that makes more sense than what you have believed from day one to however old you may be today, you think, hmm, you know, she does have a point there. You might begin to lean in that direction and vice versa. So it's about listening and having a conversation, not always attacking. What I see too much today, at least I don't know what goes on in Berlin, but I can tell you what goes on in my country. We spend too much time talking at each other, talking about each other, or talking past each other. We need to spend more time talking with each other. Just because you disagree does not mean you cannot talk with someone. And that's what I was doing with Mr. Kelly. Over time, that respect that he said he had proved true because I would listen to him. Now understand something, I did not I did not respect what Roger Kelly had to say. I'm not a supremacist, I'm not a separatist, I'm not a racist, a nationalist, any of those things. I did not respect what he had to say, but I respected his right to say it. So there's a difference. And in turn, he gave me a platform to explain my position. And over time, he began to struggle with his own ideology. He began to question his position. And over time, that cement that held his ideas together began to get cracks in it. And over more time, the cracks began to disintegrate the cement. It crumbled, and it fell apart. And then, a few years back, Mr. Kelly decided he no longer believed in what he said in that video. And Mr. Kelly quit the Ku Klux Klan. And then the Ku Klux Klan in Maryland fell apart, as well as several other states in which he was the leader. When Mr. Kelly uh, quit the Ku Klux Klan, 
gave me his robe and hood. This is the robe of the imperial wizard, the same robe that you saw him wearing in the, in the uh, video clip. And of course, this is the hood. Okay, they also call it a helmet. But this is the hood, this is the mask. Members who want anonymity, they don't want you to know who they are. They wear this mask, it's attached by three snaps or Velcro, and they look at you through these eye holes. If they don't care that you know their identity, just unsnap the mask, take off the Velcro, pull it down, and the face is exposed under the hood. And you saw both types in the video, people with their faces covered, people with their faces exposed. This is the result of conversation, not a result of fighting and talking about somebody or talking past somebody. It's a result of talking with somebody, of planting a seed. Yes, I had to sit down and listen to insulting language about me and people who look like me, but it was worth it, okay? Because I know who I am. He cannot tell me who I am. I am secure in who I am, right? And we all can be secure. Now, the two CNN people, they implied that I was strange. Well, I'll tell you what, if being strange causes people to give up stuff like this, we all need to be strange, all right, especially where I live. And when, as I said, when Mr. Kelly uh, left the Klan, the Klan fell apart in the state of Maryland. There was no more Ku Klux Klan in Maryland for, for a long time, over 10 years, all right? Now it has started back up with somebody else. And guess what? I'm there working with that guy. Okay, he went to prison a couple weeks ago, but we have made some progress. He is an imperial wizard. He invited me to his wedding, and I'm the one who walked his bride down the aisle and gave her to him. And anyway, uh, CNN covered that also. But you know, it, it bothers me a great deal as, as an American. I mean, I guess any country has their pride, you know, and we claim to be the greatest nation on the face of this earth. Well. Don't get me wrong, I'm patriotic, I love my country. I do have some problems with that, with that statement though. Perhaps we are the greatest technologically. We, Americans, put a man on the moon before anybody else. And when that man was up there, his name was Neil Armstrong, when he was up there walking around the moon, he made that famous statement, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We were able to talk with Mr. Armstrong all the way from Earth to the moon via satellite radio phone. We, Americans, invented that technology. Everybody in here has email. Everybody in here has a cell phone. You hit a few words, hit a few numbers, hit send. You're talking to people anywhere in Europe, across the Atlantic Ocean, China, Australia, United States, wherever, Africa. We invented that technology. It seems to me that we can talk as far away as the moon, we can talk anywhere on the face of this earth. Why can we not talk to the person who lives right next door to our house? Because he or she is a different persuasion, a different color, a different religion. It seems to me that before we can call ourselves the greatest, our ideology needs to catch up to our technology. And once we get them both up there, then we can truly say we are the greatest. Because folks, we are living in the, in, in the 21st century. We are living in space age times, but there are still too many of us thinking with stone age minds. And we can change that. This is what this is all about, helping to influence and inspire minds. And that's why I'm so happy to be brought here to meet all of you. And I hope that you will take that that, uh, that, that teaching moment and turn it into a learning moment when you go and have a conversation with someone with whom you may disagree. You can never address their issue if you're not willing to listen and learn where they're coming from. You don't have to believe them, but give them the opportunity to express their beliefs, and then you can express yours. Remember, when two enemies 
are talking, they're not fighting, they're talking. They might be yelling and screaming, raising their voice and beating their fists on the table to make a point, but at least they're talking. It's when the conversation ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. So you want to keep the conversation going. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Okay, um, thank you very much, Daryl. That was um, pretty interesting and some things I even didn't know and I've been like, as I said, reading up quite a lot. Um, you've been speaking about like the good sides of meeting the people, getting to know them, having, starting a dialogue with them. Um, what I was wondering is where would be the point for you to stop a dialogue? Where would you say that we've reached a point where there is no going further in the dialogue. Well, you know, um, there, there are truly some people who will never change, and you will recognize that. You know, there will be people on all sides who will go to their grave being hateful, being violent, being racist. But, if, you know, I'm not saying you give up on them, but realize not everybody is going to change. But if somebody is willing to sit down and have a conversation, you keep it going, always, because People were not born with this ideology. It is acquired. How is it acquired? It is acquired through conversation, through people telling them, you know, white people are bad, blacks are bad, Jews have horns, Muslims do this, you know, gay people do that. They learn that through conversation. And that's how their ideology is shaped, whether it's the conversation of their parents, their environment, their peers, their workplace. It's conversation that teaches them, them this. So if you can learn it through conversation, you can unlearn it through conversation. Okay. Um, and an, another question that, in a way, crossed my mind. Um, some critics claim that spending 30 years befriending members of the Ku Klux Klan and keeping this dialogue going was, as they say it, um, a waste of time, and you could have used your time better to support the black community in, in the United States. Um, was there a point for you where you thought, okay, maybe I will put my energy in another project? I will be politically active in another way? Or was this your way of yeah, supporting a fight for less races and more equal society? You know, anytime you are the first to do something, and my, my book is the first book ever written by a black author on the Ku Klux Klan, from the perspective of sitting down face to face with these people and talking about it. There had been two books written by black authors in the 1930s, 1940s, talking about how they escaped a lynching. But here I am talking to the lynchers, all right? So anytime you know you were the first person to do something, you are always going to have your share of detractors, people who want to criticize. You know, you look at uh, Christopher Columbus, for example. Um, he wanted to, 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 to get boats from Queen Isabella. To, to, to prove the, the earth was round. And everybody told him, no, it's flat, you're crazy. Okay, so he's one person, but, but the world was against him. The astronomer, you know, we, we earthlings, we, we have egos. You know, and we believed that we were the center of the universe. We believed that the sun revolved around the earth. The one astronomer said, no, the earth revolves around the sun. They called him a heretic. They put him in jail for being crazy. But he, but he was right. And those same detractors, who 30 years ago, all right, who, who were criticizing me, and even, even recently, many of them have come back to me now after Charlotte's going to say, hey, Daryl, you know these people. What, what's going on? Tell us what's going on. Okay, because they realize the value. There's more than one way. I'm not saying that my way is the only way to solve racism. It's not. There are many different facets. We all must work together. We all must do what we can to address the common problem. Some people want to work on the, on the systemic part of racism, um, you know, address the system. I address individuals, but it's all relative. If one person changes, that, that changes a generation. He does not wear that robe anymore. He no longer has a following. It's done something. Okay. Um, thank you. I've got a lot of more questions for you, but I would like to open up. Um, for your questions, um, because I think you've got some as well. I've got some 
basic rules I just want to point out for a good discussion. So um, please put the microphone close to your mouth so that we can hear your question. Everyone can hear the question. Please introduce yourself with your name. That would just be nicer instead of speaking to an an anonymous person. Um, please ask questions regarding the topic of this panel. And please keep the questions short so that we can hear and answer as many as possible in the given time we have. And um, also something, it's, some people think it's no need to say this. I will say it anyway. Um, we will prevent the expression of racist, discrimi discriminatory, or offensive beliefs in this discussion. So keep this in mind. Um, and we will have a great discussion. I think I saw someone at the back raising his hand. Yeah. We've got a microphone going around, right? Yeah. Hello. OK. Uh, my name is Mohammed. Uh, I'm uh, living in Berlin doing software, uh, originally from Cairo, Egypt. Um, so um, the question that just crossed my mind is, you're saying that uh, your way you believe it's not the only way to fight uh, white supremacy and fascism. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think that your way is inherently against other ways, like the way that the Antifa organizes or other um, a little bit of um, uh, violent organization against white supremacy and fascism. So I think there is kind of contradiction between what you're saying and uh, th that your way might not be the only way. It's, it's also contradicting to the other ways that people are trying to fight fascism with. And I think it's actually counterproductive to the other ways that people are fighting fascism. So what do you think about that? Okay, thank you. I, I, um, I, I think your question was if this way is a bit contradictory to other ways of fighting racism and fascism, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, you said that your way of fighting racism is just one way. Right. Um, but he thought that maybe it's a bit contraproductive for the way usually anti-fascists fight um, racism and fascism by going on demonstration, stepping in their way. Um, yeah, that was yeah. his question. I mean, I, and I can appreciate other ways of fighting racism as well. Everybody must do their share. I do what I'm good at, okay? And the, the way I look at it is like, um, I don't know what you have here in Berlin as far as the police department goes, but I'll give you an example, just to make an analogy. If, if somebody, if a husband and wife are having some domestic fight in their house and, and, they're, and they're fighting physically and, and, and making a lot of noise, the neighbor calls the police. Usually in my country, two police officers will show up and they'll knock on the door and they'll go in and they'll separate the husband and wife and try to calm them down and say, you know, if you can't behave, you know, I'm gonna lock you up or I'm gonna lock both of you up, all right, for disturbing the peace, whatever. So either they calm down or somebody gets locked up, all right? And that's the end of it. Two cops, in, in, end of the, of the problem. But now, same scenario. Let's say some, some man loses his job, uh, he has no money, his, 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 his boss fired him, whatever, he, he has a breakdown, he goes home with a gun, He's holding his wife and children hostage. We have a lot of that also. He's threatening to kill everybody. So the neighbor calls the police. Well, guess what? Now it's not just two police officers who come and knock on the door. There is a unit within the police department uh, in, in my country that they call SWAT, which stands for Special Weapons and, uh, and, and Tactics. Uh, it's it's a, tr a highly trained force that comes for hostages and things like that. And these officers, they will be at the front door, they'll be at the back door, they'll be looking in the window, they might even be on your roof. They drop down from a helicopter, okay? There are sharpshooters, snipers, and the regular police force. And then there's the hostage negotiator who's trying to call the people on the phone and trying to talk to him. Hey, calm down, calm down, everything will be okay. We'll get you some help. Come out with your hands up, put the gun down. The negotiator. All of these people have different jobs the main goal is to rescue the wife and the children, all right? If the man puts down the gun and walks out, everything's okay, they're gonna jump on him, put handcuffs, he goes to jail, goes to the hospital for mental evaluation, whatever. If the sharpshooter is in the window and he sees the guy and he, he can shoot the man without injuring an innocent person, that man is dead, he's gone, okay? 
So whoever has the best uh, approach at that particular moment is who's going to take advantage. The negotiator, the man with, with the bullhorn, put your hands up, come outside, you know, whatever, or the sniper, they all are working together for the common cause. So yes, marching, demonstrating, civil disobedience, all these things are effective. Like Martin Luther King, he would have demonstrations, he would have sit-ins so people could not walk by and protests. Those, those are effective too. What I do is also effective, but the main thing is we all must be on the same page to achieve the common goal and work hand in hand for the same result. Okay, I think I saw some more hands up. Yeah, in the middle aisle, the lady, right? In the red and white striped shirt, yeah. Hi, hello. Hi. Hi, my name is Kate Hullett. And I, I just had a, a, just a, a question about the last kind of statement, the wrap up about America being great and it was number one in one thing. And I, and I was just kind of curious, does that really matter? Like if we're coming to the point of having mutual respect for each other, when, where does nationalism fit into this? Um, okay, she was referring to your last statement about um, America being great. Um, and her question was, if we all want to live in mutual respect for each other, how does uh, nationalism fit in this? It doesn't fit in. It does not fit in, okay? I mean, nationalism is one thing. You know, everybody should, you know, should take pride in their country. Okay, you know, if you take pride in your country, you are a nationalist. If Germany is your country and you like Germany, you're a German nationalist. But there's a problem when you say, I'm a white nationalist, I'm a black nationalist. That's what starts the problem. Because America is made up of so many different people, okay, and so many different cultures. So that's what starts the problem when you, when you, when you begin bringing race into it. There's nothing wrong with being proud of your country and proclaiming your country and, and taking that nationalist approach. But when you bring race into it, there's a problem. Yes? Can you use the microphone, sorry. please? I didn't, sorry, you didn't have it. So it's just when, when you say like you're number one or you're great, that positions you um, comparable to other people in a, in a similar way that anyone would with like if they say, well, I'm number one, well, then there's got to be a number two. It's got to be number three, right? So that changes the, the playing field. It well, yes, I mean, everybody takes pride. I mean, if you have a, in your case here, you have soccer teams. In the States, we have baseball teams or football teams, what we call football, okay? And each, each, each state that has a team, well, they, they take pride in their team. Our team is number one. Our team is better than your team. It's a competitive thing. I don't have a problem with competition. I don't have a problem with anybody you know, taking pride in their state or in their country. But I do have an issue when somebody interjects race into it and says, we are better because we are white, we are Aryan, or we are better because we are black, or we are whatever. That's when I have the problem. Okay, um, I, I think the topic of nationalism is always, uh, and taking pride in your country is always, um, especially in Germany, a very, um, specific topic, so um, I would like to ask if there are more questions regarding Daryl's approach um, of a dialogue with members of the Ku Klux Klan. Okay, I've got, yeah, one there and then in the front. Uh, my name is Jonathan. Um, it's an honor to hear you speak, so thank you. Uh, my question is, since you are a legend and that is a fact, um, as Klan leaders hear about uh, your successes, do they become more resistant to your strategies now? Or is it easier because you are famous? And um, he asked if it's getting more difficult for you to meet the members of the Ku Klux Klan because you're getting really famous for drawing them up out of the Ku Klux Klan. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. You know, um, they don't necessarily discriminate because you become well-known or you're not well-known. They, they look at you as, as being the enemy because you're in, you don't look like them or you don't believe as they believe. So uh, I don't think it's any more difficult. Now, in, in, initially, when I first began doing this, they did not know that I was black. 
now they all know, even if they don't meet me, they know. So I, I can't surprise them anymore because there were times when my secretary would call to make an appointment to do an interview. They said, oh yeah, have them come to our house, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You know, they don't know I'm black, so I show up and I'm knocking on the door. And, you know, they're not expecting a black guy. So they open the door, you know, what do you want? And, I, you know, they think I'm selling something. And I say, I'm Daryl Davis. And they're like, huh? And then either they say, I don't want to talk to you, or they come out on the porch and talk to me there, or they say, oh, okay, come in. You know, so you, you get all kinds of different responses. Now I can't do that approach anymore. I say, this is Daryl Davis or whatever. You know, I'd like to talk to you. And they can say yes or no. Okay, I saw two more questions, I think, in the second row here in the front. Thank you. Um, my name is Ann Wertheimer. I've been thinking about something that you said near the beginning, Mr. Davis, when you said um, you have more in common with Mr. Kelly that you have in contrast. I think right. you said, so I was, then you explained later that you both thought the other person should be able to express themselves, and I was trying to think what else there might be. Okay, yes, I made that statement. I told my secretary that I have more in common with, with Roger Kelly than I have in contrast. And I will tell you right now, you all do as well. What you do is you seek common ground. You, you establish common ground first, and you build upon that. For example, I'm sure everybody in here believes we need better education for children. Is there anybody who will raise their hand and say, no, we don't? No. Everybody in here believes we need to get rid of drugs on the street. Anybody say, no, we need more drugs on the street? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so these, these are the things, you know, similar things like that we have in common. When it came to racial matters, we were apart. But when it came to things like drugs, drugs do not discriminate. They will destroy you, regardless of whether you're rich, poor, Jew, Christian, Muslim, what, you know, Mormon, whatever, black, white, drugs will take you out. We all need better education for our children. So things like that I would build upon. I'm planting a seed so he can see, you know what? Daryl wants the same, the same thing for his family as I want for my family. I plant that seed, and he sees that and then I nurture that seed. And, I, and as you find those commonalities, you begin to build a relationship. And as you nurture that relationship, you are building a friendship, all right? And the more you build a friendship, the more you find you have in common. And the more you find you have in common, the things that you have in contrast, like your skin color, where you go to worship, the temple, the synagogue, the church, begins to matter less and less. And you, and you find that, 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 that shroud of racism, nationalism, su superiority began to fade away because they began to see you as a human being. They see you reflected back to them as what they believe in, in terms of humanity. Yes, hi. Is it on? Yeah. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Stefan. Uh, thanks, Mr. Davis, for coming to Berlin, talking you, to us tonight. Um, you talked in your uh, speech about uh, your belief that the lack of intercultural communication or interracial communication, for lack of a better word, uh, for you is at the core of the problem. Have you seen uh, interracial communication changing within your lifetime significantly? And do you think that um, a president like Donald Trump is uh, providing a context for a backlash of this communication, meaning the communication will, will probably more likely regretfully decrease instead of improve? What I see is with, uh, with Donald Trump, a lot of people think that he has increased the number of racists in our country. No, he has not. Okay, those racists have, have been there all along. Has there been an increase? Sure, every now and then people get recruited and there are a few more, all right? But 
he has not really increased the number of races. What he has increased is the number of racism, incidents caused by racists, because he has emboldened them with his speeches, his rhetoric. He has, he has made them feel like they have carte blanche to go out and say what they want to say, do what they want to do. So we're seeing a rise in racism, not a rise in racists. They've always been there, all right? Um, but in my opinion, and many people don't share it, which is fine by me, and there, and there are those who do share it. I would say, I, I did not support Donald Trump for president. As a musician, I've played for him before. I played for him long ago, around 1999, 2000, when he was a businessman doing some promotion or whatever uh, for concerts and things like that. But as president, I did not support him. But I will say this, I believe that Donald Trump is one of the best things that has happened to my country. Now, how can I say that, all right? Because, not through any intelligent design of his own, okay, trust me, but because of all the nonsense that he is doing and his behavior, he has forced us to do something that we, as a people, should have done many decades ago. He is forcing us to address the problems. In my country, it was like taboo to talk about race, to talk about abuse of women and things like that. Um, women in, in the United States today, in the 21st century, 2018, are making 79 cents on my dollar for the same amount of work, all right? Uh, we have the Me Too movement, where women have come together to talk about the abuse that, that they suffered years ago. This is the first, all right? Why, why are they doing it now? Because of all the craziness Donald Trump has said. Why are there more conversations about race? We are seeing ourselves in the mirror, and now we're being forced to address these terrible things that we are really ashamed of. We say, oh, we don't talk about that. Keep that in the closet. Don't let that out. Now we are letting it out, and that's a good thing, because you cannot move forward you know, until you address the mistakes that you, know, that you have made. Every country has a history, every. The good, the bad, the, the shameful, and the ugly. But it's all history. It all needs to take all our cards, turn them face up on the table, so we all can see what was good, what was bad, what can we fix, what can we address, to put us all on the same page. So in that regard, I think Trump is one of the best things that has happened, yes. Okay, thank you. I think I saw a question there at the back. Was that right? Or are there any more questions? Yeah, so you go at the back, then here, and then there. Hello, uh, my name is Marlene, and uh, I was wondering, did you ever get an answer? Like, I'm here, sorry, you can't oh. see me. Um, did you ever get an answer to your initial question? Like I, I did, I got two answers. Okay. Okay, the first answer, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? Because my brain is smaller than white people. Be I hate you because, you know, you're, you're prone to criminality. Uh, you're lazy, you go around raping white women, you're on welfare, all the stereotypes. That was the answer as to why they initially hated me. In the end, you know, I've got probably 44, 45 robes and hoods. Over 200 people have left the Klan. I was the impetus. I did not convert anybody. I did not convert one person. You know, you see in the media, a black musician converts 200 Klansmen. No, I did not convert one. I was the impetus for 200 To, to, to be converted. They converted themselves, all right? One person leaves, then their friends leave, and all that, so I'm, di I'm directly, directly and indirectly responsible for over 200 leaving, but they convert themselves. And, and, and when I asked the question a second time, like for example, Roger Kelly told me, Daryl, I can't hate you. I cannot hate you. You want the same things for your family as I want for mine. I've learned a lot. He even put that in writing, sent me an email saying that, and he said it to me in person and over the phone. He said leaving it was the best thing that he'd ever done. So yes, that, you know, that, that was the answer the second time around. Let me, let, me just, let, me, let me give you an example of how crazy some things are. One day I was riding around in my car, and I had this Klansman sitting next to me, and we were just talking. And he mentioned um, about black-on-black -black crime, which yes, it is, it is a problem. All right, but he said, um, well, we all know 
that black people have a gene within them that makes them violent. Now I'm driving, right? I'm listening to him. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, you all have this gene. I said, what, what, what do you mean, a gene? Now, I've heard this before from other Klan people. And he said, well, who's doing all the drive-bys and carjackings in Southeast? He was referring to Southeast Washington, D.C., which is predominantly black and a lot of crime. I said, okay, it's black people. But that's what lives there. I said, who was doing all the crime in Bangor, Maine? another state. You know, it's mostly white people. I said, it's white people, because that's what lives there. I said, you know, you're not considering the demographics of the area. He goes, no, 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 you all have this gene. I said, listen, man, I said, I'm as black as anybody you, you've ever seen. I have never done a carjacking. I have never done a drive-by shooting. How do you explain that? He didn't even think about it. He answered me like that. He said, your gene is latent. It hasn't come out yet. It almost came out right then, right? But I was, I was speechless because how, how can you attack anything like that? There was nothing for me to bite into and chew on it. So I, I'm just driving along, huh, I've got this latent gene, right? And I thought about it, and then I said to him, I said, well, we all know that all white people have a gene within them that makes them a serial killer. He says, huh? I said, name me three black serial killers. He couldn't do it. I named one for him. I said, here, I'm going to give you one. Just name me two. He couldn't do it. I said, Charles Manson, Jeffrey Dahmer, Henry Lee Lucas, uh, John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, David Berkowitz, Son of Sam, Albert DeSalvo, the Boston Strangler, on and on and on. I said, son, you're a serial killer. He said, Daryl. I never killed anybody. I said, your gene is latent, hasn't come out yet. He said, well, duh, that's stupid. I said, well, duh, yeah, you're right, it is stupid. But it's no more stupid for me to say that about you than what you said about me. And he got very, very quiet. His wheels were spinning, but he didn't say anything, all right? And then when he spoke again, he changed the subject. Within five months, he quit the Ku Klux Klan. His robe was the first robe I ever got, based on that stupid conversation. I was hoping to hear this story. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was one question here, and then somewhere over there, but first here. This is on? OK. Yes. Uh, hi, my name's Chris. Um, hey, Chris. I think earlier. Uh, you had referred to Richard Preston, who was yes. the Klan guy who was arrested for firing a gun at Unite the Right. Um, I was just curious to hear a little bit more about, um, like he's in jail now, he was convicted at trial. Could you just tell us a little bit about what's going on with Richard Preston? Yes, if you people uh, had seen any of the footage uh, on YouTube or whatever, or on the news even, uh, of the uh, incidents in Charlottesville, you will see this, uh, this man, a uh, black guy with a improvised uh, flamethrower. He's, he's pointing the flame at some Klansmen who are coming down uh, some steps from the park where the Confederate statue is. And so he, he's shooting the flame at these people. One of the Klan guys has a Confederate flag on a pole. He's trying to hit the guy or hit the can out of his hand. And uh, Richard Preston, who, who is a Klan leader, is walking by and he pulls out his gun and yells, hey nigger, to the, um, to the, to the black guy. And then he, he says, put the, put, put the flamethrower down, and he points the gun at him, and he points it to the ground and fires the gun. And the bullet goes into the ground in that area. Now the police are all standing there. You can see them in the video. They did absolutely nothing. The, uh, the cops, police, were told to stand down, wait for the National Guard to come. So this is why a lot of these incidents happened in Charlottesville. There was no police interaction. Had, had police been there doing their job, perhaps James Fields would not have been running, the, running those people down. Perhaps Richard Preston would not have pulled out his gun. Perhaps the black guy would not have pulled out the flamethrower, whatever. All right, but they were not doing what they're paid to do, which is to serve and protect. So anyway, um, Preston was, was, uh, was, was later arrested and, uh, and charged with um, discharging a firearm 
within 1,000 feet of a school, which is illegal, even though school was out and you know, it's summertime, August, and there's nobody in school. But I know Richard Preston, and he had started up the Klan after Roger Kelly had, had been dormant for at least 10 years, nine years. And I, uh, I, uh, I've been talking to him on the phone long before Charlottesville. And then we met, and I said, listen, man, I'd like you to go down to the new Smithsonian uh, National Museum of African American Heritage and History, History and Culture. And he agreed to go. So I picked him up, came to my house, I took him and his fiance down to the museum, and we took a tour of the museum so he could learn something about American history, the other side of American history. All he knows is Confederate history. All right? And he, he complied, he learned a lot. There were some things he did not see that he wanted to see, or he, so he figured you know, they weren't in the museum. But there, were, but there was a lot that he did not know. And um, I've been to his home many times. He's been to my home. And he got married a couple weeks later, and I was asked if I would give away the bride. So I walked her down the aisle and presented her to him. And when I gave her to him, right, all this was, was filmed by CNN. So they asked you know, if they could come. And um, I said, I have no problem with it, but it's his wedding. You have to ask him. He said he didn't care. When I gave the bride to Richard Preston, I bent over and I kissed her on the cheek. And don't you know, that started a whole storm with Klan all over the country, calling him, threatening him, cussing him out. He's a race trader. How could you let a black man walk your, your fiance down the aisle? And then he kissed her on the cheek and blah, blah, blah. So now he's seeing how ridiculous the whole thing that he was involved in uh, was. And so he, he too has to think about, you know, does he continue with, with, this, with this false belief or what? So right now he's in prison. Uh, he was sentenced to eight years for shooting the gun, even though he didn't hit anybody, with four years suspended, three years probation, and 10 years good behavior. Okay. A week after he got married. Okay, we've got one more question over here, and I think we've got time for one more uh, question. <clears throat> Hello, Yanis Yansha is my name. Thank you for the speech. It was uh, really inspiring. Thank you. And uh, I would just like uh, to hear your quick uh, uh, reflection on a big issue, a relation between race and class, maybe from your experience, from the encounters you had in this uh, process uh, that you've been going through. Well, you know, for me, there is no such thing as race. Race is a man-made construct. You know, there is one race. It's the human race. It's man that divides us and categorizes us and puts us in a box. So I don't really make a, a distinction with race. In terms of class, uh, yes, there are different classes depending upon educational level, financial uh, income, we do have those classes. And you know, some people make more money than other people. Some people have a moderate income. Some people have no income or they're on government assistance. So yes, there are classes, uh, uh, levels of, um, of, of living. But in terms of race, I believe we all are equal. Um, I, I think his question more aimed um, at if, if in a way the, the skin color you have um, makes it more difficult for you to go up in higher classes. So what we often see is that um, white people earn much more money as right. the black people. Black people are more likely to be unemployed, have um, less, less possibility for higher education. I think this was what you were aiming at with your question, right? So the question is, what do I think about that? Yeah. Or, <laughs> well, I think it's terrible, which is why, <laughs> which is why I'm fighting it. Of course, and, you know, and it's the same thing with women, as I pointed out earlier, you know, for the same amount of work, they're being paid almost 30 cents, you know, almost 30 cents less you know, than a man, 29 cents less, 28 cents less than a man for the same amount of money, I mean, for the same amount of, amount of work. So yes, these are things that have to be addressed. And I spoke at both women's marches on Washington, D.C., the one this year and the one last year, I was the speaker on behalf of women. And what it's going to take is it's going to take people working together to change this. Not just one race 
you know, and I'm using that word loosely because I don't believe there is one race, okay, but you understand what I'm saying. Um, we have to work together to resolve this problem. For example, you take President Obama, all right? The first, uh, you know, black president of the United States. From, from George to George, from Washington to Bush, we've had nothing but white men, no women, no one of color, until Obama in 2008. Now, Obama could never have won the White House 20 years ago. America was not ready for that. They were barely ready in 2008. But attitudes had changed enough that there were enough white people to vote to put a black man in office. They wanted change. They liked his policy better. Black people did not put Obama in office. White people put Obama in office in the United States. How is that? Because black people only make up 12% of the U.S. population, 12%. About 84% of the U.S. is white. So if every black person in the United States, even children and babies and their dogs, could vote, that would not be enough to put Obama in office if white people wanted somebody else. It took the black vote and a lot of the white vote to put him in, in, in the White House. That was not mentally uh, uh, ready 20 years ago, okay? Hopefully one day there will be a woman in the White House. So I see things changing, but the change has not gone far enough yet. We've come a long ways, but we still have a long ways to go. Um, ideologically, there are many countries around the world. There are countries around the world that we consider to be third world countries um, that have female presidents, female prime ministers. They don't think in terms of, you know, we need a male to run this country or we need a female. They think, who has the best policy? Who is going to get the job done? We need more of that attitude in my country. I think um, we're running out of time, and it was a very nice last word from you to have more people that don't care about race or gender or anything, but look at what a person can do, what their qualities are, what they're good in. Um, thank you all for your questions. Darryl, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. And yeah, um, Tatiana will tell you now what's happening next. Yes, first I want to deeply thank you for this great keynote. So, uh, I think it was a wonderful start of our conference. And uh, I want to remind everybody to come back in half an hour at 7, that we go on with our panel across and within right-wing extremism, investigations and interferences. So please come back and now we do a break of half an hour and thank you very much again.